This is the Job Stories Podcast, how people find work that matters. It's only taken us like 50 something recordings of the Job Stories Podcast before I get my wife to come on. Big supporter of the show. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Anyways, Kylie, thanks for coming. Introduce yourself and what is your career? What do you do? My name is Kylie Dean and I am a singer songwriter. How long have you been singing and songwriting? 25 years. So I'm asking you all these questions like I don't know. Yeah. But it's for the audience. I don't know. Okay. Totally. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. So you said how many years? 25? About 25 years. Okay. How'd it get started for you? Um, well, 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 go back. Go back. Go back. So did, how, how did you started singing at an early age? Yeah. I My mom would say I started singing like exceptionally well around like three or four. Like I had 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 my ear like kind of trained listening to pop 40 music. Like I would, so she saw something in me. Um, but I really started like wanting it to be what I did probably around middle school and high school. Sorry, let me turn that down. It's a beep on the job stories podcast. We had a beep music stories. Yeah, this is the music edition of the Job Stories podcast. Is it? That'll come later. We'll tease them later. Huh. Keep going. <laughs> um. <laughs> so in, mid- in middle school. Middle school, I like joined the choir where we got to wear really cute cummerbunds and like shiny bow ties. And I had my first solo. I sang Vision of Love by Mariah Carey. And that's when I kind of knew, although I, I had a microphone like this and I was like this, I had no stage presence whatsoever. But I knew that's what I wanted to do. The crowd was, you know, going oh wild, gosh. wild. And I think it was more about my comfort bun at that point, but still it gave me the confidence to move forward and sing in my choir at church. That's where I was discovered at an early age, about like my junior year in high school. And then I went on tour with Brittany because I got found in my church and that was my kind of like introduction into the world is a tour bus with Britney Spears and her first tour. So uh, I know this, but you said you sang Vision of Love. Mariah Carey, your biggest inspiration? Yes. Mariah Carey, um, she was, you know, people would be like, hey, do you have a vocal coach? And I'd be like, no, well, yeah. And I would give my credit to Mariah because I would literally, you know, back in the day, you'd have a cassette tape and you would put it in your cassette player and I would put on headphones And I would literally sit up in my room for hours and practice her runs. Mm -hmm. And little did I know back then, that was how you trained your ear. People, how do you become a singer? It's because it all starts in the ear. And if you can hear how you should sound and then you emulate what you hear, you're bacon. Okay, so maybe that's a touch of some sound advice for somebody that's maybe in middle school. Mm -hmm. thinking they want to be a singer one day sure of course like also too when people say how do you get how do you meet people it's all about saying yes to every single opportunity that uh, that comes your way so when people would say you want to sing at my wedding you want to blah 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 you want to sing in church had I said no to the solo that they said sing I would have never had you know Mark Goff my voice would have never landed on Mark Goff's ears who was the guy who introduced me to Britney shout out to Mark Goff shout out to Mark G. Yeah, so ultimately, don't let the cummerbund stop you. Join the choir. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> or push the choir out of the way, take that cummerbund off, and make... Yeah, fair. Yeah, Make fair. room for... Tips. Make double. <laughs> I don't know where I'm going with that one. Um, so <laughs> anyway. just a quick shout out to a former guest of the Job Stories podcast, Christian Dominguez, who coincidentally yeah. also is very inspired by Mariah Carey. He is. Shout out he to Christian Dom he Dominguez. Can, I think Dom can actually hit the opera notes. Which notes? Like actual notes? Are we like we're the talking op- about the same person right now? Yeah, I know. <laughs> I think he wants to. I think he tries in his car. He sent me plenty of videos of him. <laughs> Doing the <laughs> we'll send we'll send everybody a link to those clips of yeah. Dom singing "Vision of Love." Yes. So you uh, go on tour with Britney Spears um, in high school. Yeah. Okay. So you didn't finish your high school diploma. Your mom did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, that was stupid. I am. I'm pretty sure my mom cheated her way through high school. Well, so, so did I. I. I treated my way up till junior year. Mm. Um, yeah, I actually left high school I left my senior year I finished my junior left my senior 
senior year. And then I remember people being like, oh my gosh, don't you miss it? And I was like, no, I think my prom, the night of my prom, I was on Saturday night, Saturday night live with, with her. It was like, asked you if you missed high school. Well, did you miss like, that's funny. Well, yeah, because you know, the senior year and it's supposed to be really special. Um, it was special, but I wasn't there. Yeah, you were on SNL yeah. instead of the prom. Yeah. Hmm. Literally. We were on Saturday Night Live the night of my prom. We can find some clips of that SNL, too. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll link it in the comments. Yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> All right, so Britney Spears to not finishing high school but doing crazy tours in SNL. What came after that? I met my manager, Kyrie Brown. Shout out. Shout out to Kyrie Brown. Uh, we He took me under his wing. Uh, fast forward a couple years, I signed to uh, Interscope with Beat Club with Timbaland uh, under Jimmy Iovine's, I guess he was the head of Interscope then, and did an album with Timbaland that never saw the light of day, as many artists can kind of like understand and So relate Timbaland to. produced your first album. Yeah, for, Simple Girl. For the audience here mm -hmm. that I know you're singing. I literally reached out to Tim the other day. The name of the album was Simple Girl, and I said, hey... Something about Simple Girl. He goes, I don't remember that song. I was like, the mm. title of the album, you don't remember that song? I mean, that is. Okay. Yeah. All right. You need to send him a song. He'd yeah. remember the beats. Probably. Yeah. It was 2004, so it was a minute ago. Well, and. Yeah. I, this year, it, no, it was 2003. This year is the 20 year anniversary. We should probably. Versary. Anniversary. We, we should, should probably do something the album with again. it. again. We should. Um, with crappier beats. Dude. <laughs> Well, that would be anything <laughs> that try to yeah. copy Timbaland is definitely going to be worse. Sure. Shout out to Timbaland, too. I saw him recently in uh, Miami Web 3. Weld Recruiting does a lot of Web 3 stuff. So um, we went down to Art Basel and he had a, Timbaland had a really cool panel. He's doing a ton of like metaverse stuff. But anyway, I digress. Yeah, him and a couple of folks are doing like a lot of, they have a lot of like Web 3 uh, metaverse initiatives for music. Good for him. It's cool. Smart. It's a good panel, too. Okay, so you did a record with Timbaland. That ultimately did not get released or publicized like you wanted to. So then what happened? I asked for a release from Interscope and they released me. And I think Jimmy Iovine was pretty gangster at that time, probably literally, but figuratively speaking on my end. So I don't get in trouble. Um, nobody really wanted to mess with me after Jimmy. So I never got nobody picked wanted up. to sign you. No. Well, if is Jimmy that how it works? can like if you get dropped you kind of get signed by somebody else later yeah you can and you can also you know be signed to a person that people don't want to maybe be on the bad side of or you know they don't want to go after that person like if jimmy Iveen can't break kylie dean i'm not gonna break kylie dean or i can't break kylie dean you know what i mean yeah kind of the word we use um is politics politics there it is yeah, yeah. definitely but we don't we became, don't talk about politics on this show no, <laughs> no. Okay. it was uh i was a hundred percent the uh, the uh, tennis ball in a very politicky tennis match for sure. Yeah, honestly, I got screwed. Honestly, very little that you probably felt like you can control. Very and, little. And I'm bringing this full circle because that's there's some of that from you know we do a lot of entrepreneurial stuff. I mess that word up every time, but we do a lot of that on this show. We have a lot of entrepreneurs, um, and it feels like that running your own business that like there's a ton you can't control. But yeah. and there's highs and lows in managing the both. So sure. at this particular point in your job story, shout oh. out to job stories. Job stories. Um, uh, this is a low. Yeah. You went from being signed. Well, let's say SNL on prom night to mm -hmm. being signed is awful. That's a high. I mean, you had a baby that you created with a genius, not a physical baby, but like a baby that oh, you yeah. created, and then. You're the next thing. Stardom is literally you can touch it, and then politics ruin your entire career. It's pretty, pretty wild. And I was that it broke me apart. I mean, I didn't want to keep. I, I don't know what I don't. There's parts of my myself that I learned in that point. Like, okay, Kylie, got to keep going. But and we did. We kept going. Me and Kai, and you know, um, it just it was hard when every door you walked through for whatever reason didn't didn't and back in the day you had to have a you there was no independent artist there was no uh do it yourself being signed was an actual like you were it was a um what's the word where it's like where it's rare yeah it I was mean, a rare thing oh no, rare is right yeah, yeah no, it was were... a rarity so like you had to have record labels 
you didn't have social media, you didn't have those things. So, um, and it was small, it was a small world. Everybody knew each other. Everybody knew their artist. Everybody knew who was going to break. And, uh, I think, you know, my story was just a little sensitive because I had the, the best of the best team and it still wasn't going to work in my favor. I meant to back up to, uh, so just real quick, cause I think it is important for job stories outside of, um, music. Uh, how did you meet Timbaland? With Jay Brown and Kyrie in Shout a hotel. Jay Brown. Hi, Jay Brown and a hotel lobby on the. Remember when J Lo wore that really the dress that broke her? How could I forget? Yeah. <laughs> Stupid. Do I remember? It was that. It's like I actually don't remember. I know. It's funny. No, you do. It's the green dress that came up and la la la. It was that Grammy Awards. I performed with Britney in L.A. and afterward, Jay asked me to come meet Tim in a lobby and I sang for him in a hotel lobby at like 3 a.m. And at that point, it, you know, game on. Yeah. So the reason I wanted to touch on that to tie it into job stories is because like everything is so relational. Everything is relational. Like you're, it's uh, all about who you know. Um, not anymore, I guess. But yeah, I guess. I think. Well, so. it is. I think it so. is. I think so. Yeah. I'm going to take it one step further. But even if you know those people, you still have to be a good human being. Being right, you too. Not necessarily. There's some pretty <laughs> shitty people in my industry. <laughs> there you go. Moving on. <laughs> okay. Totally. You can be, but I'm saying anything worthwhile, like like building relationships and being a good person is a catalyst for like good things happening. And at that time, I understand that it didn't like some things went south afterwards. Mm -hmm. But at that time, that's a huge deal. What is y you experienced um a very large high that a very small population Absolutely. of the music of folks that try to run down music get to do. Meaning uh, you met Timbaland, who is still one of the biggest producers ever. And especially at that time, probably the biggest producer in the world. Um, and you got that through relationships because yeah, Jay, Jay and Kyrie are brothers believed in you, yeah. loved you. Yeah. So it's like talent meets be a good person meets opportunity like it's kind of all of it in any industry I feel like and Tim saw that in me you know I was only what 18 when I met him and you know he saw this really sweet new fresh innocent girl and he respected that and he loved that about me and he you know he would he, he, he's like you're like my little sister I want to look out for you and so yeah that goodness and that purity of like decent human being yeah of course people regardless of a shitty person or a good person that's going to come through people are going to be like that's a good human you know mm -hmm. and it did work in my favor then because i wasn't i was hungry i was young i was all the things super talented. A new, yeah and very talented but you can say that can't you mm -hmm. i don't want to like well it matters i think it does matter i think and then in our world like i mean it's not every like it's not you don't have to necessarily have all the skills right now but at least be working towards them more yeah, in our sure, world sure but you were kind of an outlier because at that time you kind of already had it all from a this is true standpoint. yeah the one thing I never did was write I never really liked songwriting because I was up against I mean I came up with Tim I came up with Ryan Tedder I mean working around I Shout came up with to Ryan Taylor. yeah I came up with a dream I came up with Neo all these people are like they were in my circle and then dream not so much but but Neo and Ryan definitely and like to see how amazing they were at writing I didn't really want to like mm -hmm. go there because I knew I could dominate daunting. singing mm -hmm. you know what I mean and yeah. I am a perfectionist it's it's unfortunate in some ways because when you're a perfectionist, you sometimes don't want to try. That's kind of where I've, like, I don't want to try writing because he's so oh. good. Why am I going to try? Oh, I've talked to people for podcasting. I mean, I felt that way for our business. But, mm -hmm. like, if the unknown keeps you from trying big time. Then you're going to regret it. Well, yeah. I mean, trying. that's our last guest on the podcast kind of mentioned that. He's like, you have a choice one way or another. Essentially, like, either try or don't, but live with it. So. I heard one lady say, like, you know, you can – either stop trying what you love or never try what you love and it'll always haunt you because God, I believe God puts there, he puts a, um, a desire in your heart 
mine was at a very young age. I knew I wanted to be a singer. It's pretty cool that, you know, I got to do it really young. I'm still doing it, although I'm in a really, I'm kind of in like a weird space with it. It's still what I do. And when I talk about it, I'm emotional about it. Therefore, it sets my heart on fire still when I'm just talking about it. Mm-hmm. So that that's there. And the point of my story, she says, if you if you don't try or you put it in the back, there's this part in your brain that's been molded to want that and you will regret mm. giving up or not trying. Mm. I actually disagree. Mm. <laughs> Inside joke between yeah. spouses here. Um, yeah. Okay. No, you're right. Roommates, yeah, it's like that. Yeah, we're roommates. Uh it's like the Shawshank Redemption episode. Uh, episode? Movie? Quote. Quote. Shawshank Redemption quote. What does he say? Get busy get busy living or get busy dying? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know how that applies. But I think I've Shout been... out to Shawshank Redemption. <laughs> Would you stop with the shout okay. outs? All right. So moving forward. Um, yeah. So we left off at a very low point. You just got dropped and could not get signed again. Nope. What happened from there? Because they're all fools. Yeah. <laughs> they're all foolish mortals. Um, pretty much at that point of like, okay, I'm done. I was packing my suit. Done like you're quitting. I'm quitting. That's kind of where I am right now, honestly, for being honest, but we'll get there. Um, is I was done. I was living in LA. I couldn't afford to live there. Wasn't making money. Um, so I said, I'm moving home. I'm going to go get a husband, going to get barefoot pregnant, sit on my porch and do life that way. Cool. Well, that's not what God had. I, and I, my prayers were loud. I was I was like, if you want me to stay in this industry, God, you're going to have to drop something from the sky. And he did. And Kevin Antunes, shout out, um, called me eight years. Now, Kevin Antunes was, he, he put together Britney's show. This was eight years before. Nine years before. And he was uh, in Sync's MD, incredible musician, now incredible friend. I consider him a brother of mine. He's uh, calling my my manager, Kyrie, and he's like, what's up with Kylie? Madonna needs a background singer. Stat. I go in. I kill the audition. I land the Madonna gig. I'm her background singer for the next 10, 10 years, three tours. Never heard of her. Yeah, she's up and coming. Mm-hmm. All right, yeah, so that's another big high, I would say. Yeah, it was uh, pretty cool. It also was hard, if I'm being honest, and this is a stripped back interview, it was really hard for me. I was I was a... An artist. An artist. Yeah. And to go back eight years later and stand in the background was really humbling. Granted, it was for... I wouldn't do it for any probably anybody else, but it was definitely a, a humbling moment you mean at the time? You yeah. Went, you, it went on your radar to do it with anyone no. else. Yeah. And so just like, well, am I moving backwards? And, you know, I had to put that in, in perspective of who I was working with. Mm-hmm. So that once she walked in the room and the the the, the power and the um, just the, the energy she carried, I was like, okay, yeah, I'll do this. Mm-hmm. So in a yeah. little five foot two frame. It's very powerful. Five two? Something like that. She's tiny. That's how tall I was going to be without the human growth hormone. Yeah. Shout out to HGH. HGH. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. So, you now you went from a low to really kind of another high. Yeah. I mean, for like, as my grandmother would say, first class everything. Yo, know, my grandmother, when she was like on her deathbed, like dying, not dying, but like pretty much, she took over my life. And was saying that she was me. You were in the room. Mm-hmm. And that's what she said. First class everything. I traveled the world. But she was telling my story. It was wild to watch the brain do that. It was yeah. yeah. So you get this like really high profile first class job yeah. in terms of. Keep me in line, Mace. I see in, what you're doing. In Keep in me on track. In terms of money. Yes. In terms of the everything. travel. Who, I, who I'm with. Mm-hmm. The shoulders you're rubbing. The people you're meeting. Yeah. The catalyst for getting that Madonna job, just to bring the conversation from earlier full circle, was a relationship. Was a relationship from eight years prior. Yeah. And I remember, and here's the thing, Kevin, I'll never forget, it was the last show for for Brit, and we were in catering, or it was something like that. There were tables, and he came up to me, and Kevin Antoon said to me at this time, he said, you are such a good person. You're easy to work with, and I want you to know any time 
there's ever an artist that needs a background singer, you're the first on my list. He said that in 2000. And sure enough, he uh, he lived up to his word eight years later. Unfortunately, he only works with like no-name artists, like in sync. Yeah, and just tiny Madonna. artists. Yeah, no. What is uh, your coolest Madonna story? Not with her necessarily, but like on the on tour, like city, doesn't matter. I mean, it's... I mean, you did like Yankee Stadium. Yeah, You've for you, Madison. that would be cool for me. Well, I'm like, man. Well, that's what I'm prompting. Well, I mean, like uh, Oslo, Oslo, you know, Norway, it was 90,000 people. It was... Like I think the most ever um, gathering to see Madonna, it was you know watching the fans run in and fall and trip and break bones was hilarious. Trying to get a good close seat, <laughs> it wasn't funny, but it was like, not the breaking bones part. But I like, think it is hilarious. It was hilarious watching them run trying to get close to the stage. It was hilarious. They would literally piss themselves because they wouldn't want to lose their spot where, by the stage, so they just pee. On themselves. People would do that at the Battle of the Bands for us at the Crawford County Fair. <laughs> Shout out to Alma, Arkansas. <laughs> Give me my water right now. Um, You're so stupid. I can't reach it. Dang You're going to have to wait. A uh, few more minutes. Okay, so, okay, then Madonna. That back to you up to 2016, then what? You then we got married. Let's had go. to <laughs> take me away from the industry, knock me up, marry me. Not in that order, but still. And nobody called anymore. Because I had a baby and a husband. And then what? What? And then what? We moved to Nashville. Ah! You just want me to get emotional. I got cancer. To be fair, we are currently recording. I know they are. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I'll tell it for you. So, in 2019, got diagnosed with breast cancer. So, we're back to probably another low here. Yeah. Yeah, so quite the journey. Um, well, it's it was crazy, too, because, like, that year Madonna went on tour, and... This is the truth. I, she hired two. Uh, she hired other girls, um, which is fine. Well, and you know Munchie really well. I love Munchie. Shout out to Munchie. Yeah. And I remember being like, okay, something great's going to happen this year. And it was cancer. And that was really hard. Because doing, you know, I'm not doing what I love. And not only am I not doing what I love, I'm fighting cancer. So it was like really hard. I've had to go through a lot of, a lot of um, therapy for this. Obviously I still can't get through an interview without talking, crying about it, talking about it. But yeah, it was, it was a really shitty year. And then 2020 rolled around and you know, the world stopped and that's when my chemo started. And, Almost lost my life two times to the chemo drugs because they're so intense. And it was losing a part of your body. It was just, it was so much. It was so much. And, you know, we're good now. But, yeah, that low um, was very, very, very low. Didn't feel like there was a bottom. Mm -hmm. You just keep falling. I think it is uh, another theme for this podcast, like uh – finding something you love and doing that because i mean you talked about singing is what you love and what you've always loved and not being able to do that is or not 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 being able to do it but having not done it as much mostly due moving to, to nashville and like knowing nobody i know nobody in the industry here i don't know songwriters i don't know that's, really that's hyperbolic by the way we do know some we people. know some yeah <laughs> but like not like i did in la you know i knew everybody not as many relationships here as you had there sure and i'm having to make them on my own you know with Kyrie, he he had had relationships and kind of brought me in and it was just a thing uh it was easier i thought meeting people there because of my team but now i'm doing it on my own I've been sick. I have a kid. All these other, all these other factors came in. And just recently I've really gotten like, um, a lot healthier, um, mentally, physically in a lot of ways. So it's like game on just as of late last year, mm -hmm. you know, that was, there were things that ha had to get out of my way in my life that were holding me back. And, you know, with those things gone and getting help for these emotions that clearly still show themselves very well, 
um, it makes it easier to take that next step to do whatever that next step is. Yeah, I'm going to tease our next step here in just a second. But, uh, what is that? Um, Sorry for crying. I'm not going to tease it before I tease it. What are you gonna I'm going to do a pre-tease. <laughs> Doesn't make any sense. <laughs> no. Um, what would be a, a skill from a music standpoint? I'm leading the witness a little bit because you talked about not writing as much. Mm-hmm. Nashville's a very writey town. Like yeah. Everybody here writes. It could be that. What What's something else? I also know that you're a bomb vocal producer. So like. So for me, I do write now. I didn't back then. I may, maybe should make that more clear. I didn't write back in the day because of the people that I was surrounded with were so good. Mm-hmm. And that was before they even really made it, you know, got mm-hmm. their first hit. So for me, um, I knew that was something I wanted to do. I wrote the last two EPs I did. I realized, okay, I actually have something in this pen. I let might as well get the ink out. So I started that and just realized it's something I do love and it's coupled with like my voice. And then also with writing, I love vocal production and I really, I've had a chance to vocal produce on my best friend's record, Matthew Morrison. That, that was a blast. And I think that's also Shout too. Shout out to Maddie Mo. Maddie Mo in the ha- his house. Um, Maddie Fresh. Maddie Fresh is what they, I think his they name call is. They in the streets. I think so. Yes. If you don't know, now you know. Um, he gave me a chance to vocal produce his last record and it was so fun. And so we did it in a way that wasn't ideal. You know, he was, I think he was actually doing Broadway or somewhere. I couldn't be in the room with him. So we had to do it, um, zoom style. And I ended up just absolutely loving it. And then I've been doing some of that here in Nashville. Mm -hmm. And this year I really want to dive in and be like, okay, I actually have a call with, Um, a friend who's very well known in the vocal production world um, after we do this interview. I think it's cool. I think it's cool because I mean, obviously you're, you're good at arranging parts, harmonies, all that kind of stuff, but uh, supporting, uh, let's see a way to word this, getting the best out of someone else that maybe they didn't know was in there for themselves. Yeah. There's a lot of, there's a lot of people too that don't know they have is sorry. These chairs are loud. Um, there's there's people who have things in their voices that they don't realize they have for instance i'll use me i I had a uh, like a uh, like that that i had to get rid of it was a habit that i created that i didn't hear but when you had somebody else listening to you they would point it out and they would break that habit because it would get annoying some people are pitchy some people are whatever we all have it and when you have somebody like a kook right? He's very well known as a vocal producer. He got the best vocals out of Rihanna and made her sound the way she sounded on, what's that record that I love? The real soulful one? I, mean, I, would, I don't know if we can see it. 